you turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 2, we're going to start there this morning. We've been going through key figures in Scripture, talking about uh, the call of God on, on the lives of mankind. Some of you may feel like this is a little bit repetitious. Gee whiz, Pastor, how many times are you going to talk about people being called by God? It is a little bit repetitious, but at the same time, every circumstance is unique. Every individual that we see in the scripture that is called by God is coming from a different background, a different unique situation. And uh, Ezekiel's situation is obviously uh, unique from Moses, who we talked about, and also is unique uh, from Abraham, who we talked about the week before. So in all these circumstances, they're unique. And I hope that at some point we can find ourselves in the places where these individuals are and allow ourselves to find what it is that God's called us to do. Now, some of us may find a call, uh, as myself, say, well, I, I, I'm called to preach. Some of us may not. Some of us may just simply make daily obedience my call. Amen? And that's okay. There's not a thing wrong with that. I don't want you to get hung up thinking, well, God hadn't told me specifically what it is that he wants me to do. But at the same time, God's called us all to do something. We have been commissioned by Jesus Christ to join the Great Commission. What does that look like for you? It's going to look different from me. And, and, and the call and directives in your life is going to be similar but different from me. Amen? So as we go through these, I'm going to do these, and then, and, and then one more in a couple of weeks that we'll look at. Uh, but, but today, Ezekiel is, is uh, also called of God but different. How many of you like somebody that's a little bit different? Look at your pastor and say amen. amen. Yeah? He's a little bit different. A little bit of background on Ezekiel. Ezekiel was born under the leadership of King Josiah. King Josiah was the king in those days in the nation of Judah, which Israel had been divided into an upper and lower kingdom, and Judah was the smaller and, and, and lower kingdom. And, and Josiah became the king at a very young age. In my mind, I'm thinking he was eight years old. He was just a boy when he became the king. But Josiah had been prophesied about uh, decades, if not 100 years or more, prior to his birth that there would be a king who would bring reformation in Israel, and his name was Josiah. And so he comes in, and he becomes king, and we know that, we know that Josiah's story is pretty well, I hope, but Josiah, in his reign, is when they discovered the word of God hidden in the temple. Josiah's, uh, the priests come in and say, we've discovered this. Josiah reads it and tears his clothes and says, we've sinned against God. And they begin to break down the altars and the Asherah poles and Asherahs and all these things. And, and there was reformation in Israel. Worship began again. Sacrifice began again. So in this time is when Ezekiel was born. Praise God for a man to be born in a time of repentance. I know this probably has little to do with it. But you know the first five years of an individual's life is very important to them. Mamas, if your babies are here at this church and you got them over there in GK Jr. and they're being taught and ministered to, uh, that, that wing over there is the most important part of our church, and you don't realize that, but it is. Not that the church is the be-all, end-all of your kids. We are a tool to help you in discipleship of your children. Amen? Ezekiel was raised up in a time where repentance was clear, where, where Messiah, where, I'm sorry, where Yeshua, where Jehovah was worshipped again, and he was pursued and sought after. And so he was raised up in this. And 30 years later, now Israel and, and Israel had already gone into captivity. Judah is, it has gone into captivity. And at the point of this reading, they'd been in captivity for probably about five years. They were in exile. Ezekiel was taken from his home, he was moved to Babylon, he was exiled from his place of comfort, his place of familiarity, he was removed from his home. Some of us don't really grasp this when we talk about exile, it's way too clean, you know, it's, it's, it's way too uh, just biblical, well, it's, they were exiled, you know, he was just exiled, well, all right, let's, let's exile all of us this morning, okay, and I'm not going to use a nation just because I don't want to point out a nation. Don't want to be mean like that. So we'll use an organization. Let's just say ISIS. Okay? ISIS decides to come into our nation and overtake us. They overwhelm uh, our military. They overwhelm our government. They, they work their way inside of our borders. They take control and seize control of everything, including our military, including our government, and all things. They come in, and they not only seize control of our money and our wealth, they now come through and they find the most intelligent, they find the most handsome, the most beautiful, the most educated, 
the wealthiest, the most influential people from our culture, and they now take them out of the borders of our nation, and they take them over to their nation, and they begin to train them and teach them so that now all of the brightest can be an asset to their nation and to their agenda. Well, they leave behind the rest of us, you know, the rest of us that aren't intelligent and beautiful and educated to work the fields. That's why we're all here. Just kidding. To work the fields, but not, not to gain wealth. I mean, you would think, wow, they got rid of part of the population. Now I can step up. Absolutely not. What they've done is, is now we work the fields and the land, and we work in the factories and all of these things, not to make ourselves wealthy. We'll live off of a little bit, but most of our money now goes over to that nation. Oh, and did I mention that when they pulled out and took control of everything and took the brightest, the beautiful, and the most educated, everybody out of our nation, the wealthiest, they're all gone. You know what they did then is they burned down all of our churches. They collected all of our Bibles, everything that was religious or held any value towards our worship for God at all. They destroyed all that stuff and said we could no longer take part in those things. It was now illegal. Then we might understand a hint of exile, just a little bit. See, in our minds, that's just so far from reality. It doesn't make sense. But that's exactly where we find Ezekiel. In Babylon, kneeling beside a river seeking God. Now, I said all of these experiences are a little bit different, but, but there's one point that I haven't brought out. Maybe I'll talk about it a little bit next week. But there's one consistent thing that we see with all these people as they're called is this, that, that somehow they have an encounter with God. At some point, it begins with a revelation of who God is in some capacity. An awareness, an understanding the Spirit of God is here. An awareness, an understanding of the majesty and the glory of God. When we start reading here in chapter 2 of Ezekiel, it's following an experience of him going, wow, that's God. A big, beautiful presentation of, of, of beautiful angels and, and the work of just some things that were obviously supernatural and wheels and turning and, and faces and what is all this stuff? Wings. The revelation. The spirit of God. The glory of God. A revelation of God. Where? As he was praying and seeking God in a time of exile. Moses found a burning bush, had an encounter with God. Abraham had an encounter with God and was asked to leave his country and his families, the families, his brother and families behind. He was told to leave and go to a place he didn't, he didn't know, but a place that was promised to be given to him. Paul, who I thought I might talk about in weeks ahead, but I can't, had a vision of Jesus, a revelation, right? So folks, don't ever discredit your time of prayer or times like this this morning where the Lord speaks to you, don't ever discredit that because it's out of that presence where God brings revelation and calling into your life and will direct you. If we can learn to cultivate that in our daily walk, in our morning before we get up and we go out to do work or anything else, if we can cultivate this atmosphere, this presence of God in my heart and in my life, whether it's with a cup of coffee and my Bible open on my lap, which it would never be me because I can't stand that black, nasty, horrible liquid. But I realize it's popular for some. Maybe it's a cup of milk. That would be me. Whatever it may be. Maybe it's in your car as you worship. Cultivate the presence of God, and God will lead you. He'll show up. Lord, direct my steps. I meet uh, with, with some men on Thursday mornings to pray here from our church. At 6.30 on Thursdays, any men in this church are welcome to come. We just come and seek the Lord. But a lot of times I'll end that prayer, and these guys know this, that we'll pray for direction for the rest of the day. Lord, I don't know what this day, this day holds for me. It's going to unfold before me as a scroll. I'm not going to see it and understand it until it reveals itself. God, give me the wisdom. Give me your words. Give me insight. Give me what I need today to honor you. You know that should be a daily prayer for all of us. Not that God's not going to do it. He will do it. But that's also bringing ourselves under control, knowing that God is in control. Amen. I probably ought to start this sermon at some point. Ezekiel chapter 2. We're going to look at a few hurdles and one encouragement for us today as it pertains to uh, the call in Ezekiel's life. 
Ezekiel chapter 2, after a really intense revelation of God, verses 1 and 2, He said to me, speaking of God, Son of man, stand up on your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. First hurdle that I want to talk to you about today, which we've already hit on just a little bit, I'm going to go at it from a little bit different angle this time, but is this, oftentimes, is the hurdle of humility. You say, I don't see anything in this passage about humility, Pastor Bob. I see Ezekiel's posture. His posture was humility before God. His call came after he humbled himself. His call came after he was in a very intense situation in exile, humbling himself, pursuing and seeking God by a river when God revealed himself to him. He found him face down in a place that seemed like he and his nation had been forsaken by God. He was face down before God in a time of pain, in a time of turmoil. Ezekiel was humble enough to remain faithful to God. If anybody had any excuse to be angry at God, it was Ezekiel. He ripped me from my home and, you know, he didn't deliver us and all these things. But the reality of it is this. Ezekiel was a man of God. He realized that this was a result of sin. Not that God hated them. Not that God wanted them there. Ezekiel was a man of God. He was a man of word raised up underneath a a king that had reformed Israel back to the word again. And so he knew the promises that were there in Deuteronomy that said, if you go in and you do the same things of the nations that are there that I'm going to drive out before you, all of these curses in this book that I've spoken will befall you. And he's going, wow, it happened. He didn't get angry at God. He humbled himself before God. He was very repentant before God. And that was where God found him, is in his place of humility rather than a place of accusation against God. He didn't become angry. He didn't judge God. And folks, I'm just going to say how easy is it at times to become God's accuser rather than a follower. How easy is it for at times of trials and difficulties to look at God and accuse Him and claim ourselves innocent and God guilty? Folks, that that is a dangerous place to go. Don't go there. How would God do this? Folks, listen. There are things that we bring on ourselves by sin that's not God's will. God warned them that this would come if they did these things, and they did those things, and so it came. Right? Right? And so Ezekiel didn't become an accuser of God. He didn't demand answers from God. Instead, he offered a heart of worship. In this time of humility, God came to him and ministered to him and called him. Many people have walked away from God with these words, I cannot serve a God that you fill in the blank. How many times have you heard that before? I don't want to serve a God that makes little children suffer. Well, God doesn't make little children suffer. You do. What are you doing for little children? Have you taken a job in the GK Junior Wing? (laughs) <laughs> Which, by the way, we, we, we need people to help check kids in. We, we need nursery work. We always need somebody. So don't hesitate. Amen? But we cannot accuse God because something in the past didn't work out exactly like I thought it should. Because I can promise you this. If you will remain faithful to God and continue with Him, you're going to see at some point He is faithful to you. You're going to get past that pain. You're going to get past that hurt. You don't know the end from the beginning. You don't see sometimes what God is doing. Hold on to hope and believe the things that you are praying for. He's going to see it through. When we are not afraid to stand up to God and tell Him what we think in opposition of Him, it is evidence of pride in our lives. Now, there is a difference. God does not want us to live with a prideful attitude because if you live with a prideful attitude, here's what's going to happen. The first time something bad happens to you, you're going to get mad at God and blame Him for all of it. How dare you do this to me and my family? Folks, listen, that's wrong. He didn't do it. He's not trying to destroy your life. He doesn't hate you. But it's evidence of pride when I don't even hesitate to lash out at him and tell him it's his fault and he's wrong in everything. That's dangerous. Now, there is a difference. It's okay to stand on the word and say, God, I believe that your word says this. And therefore, I'm praying this direction and I'm believing that you're going to be faithful to your word, what you said here. That's okay. God doesn't mind being tested in those areas. Test him with his word. Amen? 
But I'm telling you, folks, when you test him by the attitude of pride that tells him he's wrong and it's all his fault and be accusatory with him, it's wrong. Think of Job. Job had to go through some stuff. Job was declared righteous. But then over time, we see that there was an element of pride left in Job, and he began to demand answers from God and began to tell God, who do you think you are? Why do you do this? Blah, 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 blah. If I talk to him, I would want this. How many? Have you ever heard somebody say, I can't wait to see God because when I see him, he's going to give me some answers? And I just want to say, I can't wait for, to see you see God. Can I be there? Because you're not going to go, I want to know what. No, you're going to go. So if we start like that, what an awesome blessing. What an awesome blessing to start there so that God can see, wow, I can do something with this one. This one's got the right posture. This one's not arrogant. This one's not full of pride. This one doesn't think they have it all figured out. This one doesn't look at me and blame me for everything. This one still sees me as God, even in the impossible circumstance. Wow. I see great faith. I could use this one. Folks, listen, if you want to be used by God and you're going to be called by God, here's, here's the process. We must first humble ourselves, and then he will exalt us. I'm just going to give you some scriptures, okay? They're going to be on the screen. Quickly, if you want to write them down, you can write them down. If you don't want to write them down, you're lazy. I can email them to you later. I don't care. Just let me know. Samuel, 2 Samuel 22, 28. You save the humble, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them low. Psalm 25, 9. He get, guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Psalm 147, 6. The Lord sustains the humble but casts the wicked to the ground. James 4, 10. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Do you see a pattern? You know, Job was a little bit arrogant at one point, accusing God until he saw him. And he said, I repent in dust and ashes. Folks, we have to discern that in our lives, repent in dust and ashes, humble ourselves before God, and cry out to him. And here's the process, exactly what happened to Ezekiel. The Lord will lift us up and exalt us. This is talking about being exalted. This is talking about being raised up. But folks, hear me. God's going to do something in you. When you are called of God, God's going to do something in you that, man, and, and, and you cannot do it in yourself. You ready? If we will humble ourselves before God, he will exalt us. Here's the difference between God exalting us and us exalting ourselves. You cannot exalt yourself and remain in humility. You cannot. But if God exalts us, he does not exalt us out of humility. We take humility with us. You ever seen great men and women of God walking in humility even though they've done great things? How is that possible? That's only possible by the Spirit of God. So the working of the Holy Spirit in your life is this child of God. He wants you to humble yourself before Him. And when He calls you, when He calls you, when you have clarity, when you have the Word, when He wants to speak to you, He will lift you up. He will put you in a different posture vertically, even though your heart is still prostrate before Him. That's what He does. That's God. You can continue in humility and be exalted. So we must start with humility. No matter what the call is on our lives, no matter what we want to do for God, we have to begin humble and we have to remain humble no matter how high He exalts us. And let me just say this. You want to know how high He exalts you when you get saved after you've humbled yourself? I took a drink for just a pause for, uh, you know, for uh, effect. You want to know how high he exalts you? Paul says we are seated with him in heavenly places. Amen. Are. Have been. Have been seated with him in heavenly places. Folks, it's past tense. It takes place. So remain humble in the authority of Christ. Amen? Secondly, the second hurdle is this. In spite of his struggles, what he could have been upset and angry, he was not rebellious against God. He humbled himself instead of going with the current of the culture around him. Secondly, he had the hurdle of God-defined success. 
Not man defined, not what his idea was of success, but what God's idea was. Look at verse 3, same chapter, chapter 2. He said, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Hmm. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. And you, son of man, do not be afraid of them or their words. Do not be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you and you live among scorpions. Do not be afraid of what they say or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are rebellious. You think God's kind of making a point that they are rebellious? Bunch of stinking rebels. He said, this is, where, this is the church I'm going to have you take over, Ezekiel. I want you to go speak to these people, the rebellious ones. Another place in here he's saying, I'm not even telling you to go to the foreign nation. I'm not even telling you to go to speak to those with a different tongue. They would listen. The Babylonians would hear you. No, go to the children of Israel. Go to the, the Hebrews. Go to the ones that have rejected me. They're rebellious. And whether they listen or they don't listen, that's not your problem, Ezekiel. You just go, you hear me, you go and you speak. Leave the results up to me. Let me just say that God was not giving Ezekiel the greatest opportunity here. He didn't say, Ezekiel, I want you to go to the wealthiest, uh, most popular church. I I'm sending you, Ezekiel, to the greatest, most comfortable situation. You're going to have be the highest paid prophet ever. You're going to write a book, Ezekiel, and it's going to sell more copies than anybody else's book, Ezekiel. It's all going to be good. No, he said, Ezekiel, I'm going to send you to the worst of the stinking worst. I'm going to send you to the people that kill prophets. I'm going to send you to the ones that won't listen to me. I'm going to send you to them and tell you to talk to them and, and tell them what I say, and they don't want to hear what I say. But you have to go. Here, here's where I'm talking that we have to Get over the hurdle of a God-defined success. You say, what are you talking about? So oftentimes, young people are called into the ministry, and they get an idea. They're going to be the greatest preacher in the world. You're looking at one. Not the greatest preacher in the world. And I wasn't called to preach at first. Music. I stood in the back of a, a, the, the auditorium there at camp, and I was watching a guy play the electric guitar up front, and the Holy Spirit just simply said, I'm going to do this with you. I'd been in the presence of God for three or four days, and the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. I received it, and, and it was years later that he finally fulfilled that in my life. And then he called me to preach. You know God shifts and changes your calls if you humble yourself before him. He knows what your initial momentum is, and he's got a greater plan for you, and he'll take you from this to this to this to this. Don't ever get stuck on one thing. No, God, I can't. You called me to do this. You just obey God. But when I was that kid, I thought, I'm going to be a Christian rock and roll star. I could do it. How do you think I build a youth group? <laughs> that, uh, what was it, the, the Guitar Hero thing came out, and it was back when we had the open campus over here, and we'd have like 50 kids come over from the school, half of them didn't know Jesus, and they'd come in, it's like, hey, so uh, so and so told me that you could, like, you could play uh, song, this song off of, can you play Crazy Train? Yeah, I can play Crazy Train. <laughs> yes, I played Ozzy Osbourne and brought kids to Jesus. <laughs> It happened, all right? I'm not proud of it, <laughs> but it happened. So what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, God defined the su success. It's easy to think I'm going to do this and get the real flesh-oriented idea of what it is that God called you to, and then the call will be something totally different, right? So when the Lord gives you a word, the Lord gives you a directive, be careful not to intermingle your flesh into something and think that it's, oh, it's going to be, you know, since God called me to it, it's going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. There's going to be difficult moments. People are not easy to deal with. Amen. We are called to people in de for the benefit of people in spite of people. 
I'm just going to let that statement soak in. We're called for the benefit of people in spite of people. What he's saying is, is they're a rebellious house. They need saved, Ezekiel. You go and speak. Your victory and your success is not based upon becoming friends with everybody. Your victory and your success is based upon whether or not you say what I tell you to say. That's it. Ezekiel, you leave all the, the, the consequences up to me. Ezekiel, Ezekiel you, you sow the word and you give the word and let the harvest depend upon me. Ezekiel, I'm not calling you to be buds with them. I'm calling you to save drowning people out of the water of sin. So oftentimes we get this idea, I'm going to be in ministry. And folks, I, on Thursday I get to go and interview credential can, candidates for the district. And while I'm there, I'm going to be looking at young people that say they have a call of God on their lives. And the reality of it is this. Do they? And have they intermingled the call of God in their lives with some kind of worldly idea of success that I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to be the greatest? Or have they grasped obedience to God? It's got to be a call of Ezekiel. Our, our idea of success has got to shift from, from having the biggest church, the, most, the, the biggest paycheck, to write the most famous book, to a position of influence, and all these, it's got to move from that nonsense, folks, to am I obeying God and what he has called me and equipped me to do? You've got to be satisfied with it. I've never been more sound in knowing that I am where I'm supposed to be and I am obeying God and doing and using what he's called and equipped me to do. I'm telling you, there is no better place to be. But I can tell you this also. Pastor Don Gifford, our superintendent, who's going to be here in a few weeks, it's hard for them to fill the rebellious churches with pastors. You want to know who doesn't usually go to the, the rebellious church that's got 12 people left in it because, because they've, they've been control, they had control issues and a few board members have controlled things and run everybody off and pastors don't want to go there anymore? You want to know who doesn't go there? The minister that's been pastoring in a church of a thousand or more for the last 25 years. He doesn't leave that to go to that. It's not typical. It doesn't happen. Why? Because we have an idea of success based upon a worldly model rather than what God has said. You know who gets to go there? These kids that I'm getting ready to interview on Thursday. <laughs> well, we've got a little church over here. And it's, it's had some trouble, but you know, you can do it. God's with you. <laughs> In all seriousness, folks, I know some men of God that have left. I, I know one man specifically that, that's a friend of mine that left a church of over 1,000 people that left to go and minister in a small little dying church that was about to get shut down. And when that happens, you go, somebody had a call from God. And today, it's a it's a, the church is thriving because somebody obeyed God. But see, you can't answer a call like that without changing what success means in your, in your mind. So if we have a call from God, it can't be about me being the greatest or the best or the most well-paid or, or having the best book or the largest congregation. It can't just be about those things, folks. It's got to be about, am I hearing from God? Am I doing what God has equipped me to do? Am I doing this to, to, to reach the lost? Because he has not called you, in, just like Ezekiel, he's not called you to a popularity contest. As I said, we are called for the sake of people in spite of people. If a drowning person is in the water splashing, crying for help, the worst thing we can do is say, oh, hey, how are you? And, and how are, do you know, where are you from? Covington. Oh, really? Really? Do you know the Kings? They go to our church. They're nice people. Real, oh, Herb coached me in football, too. Yeah. Yeah, oh, no, wait, come back. Wait, I didn't get to tell you the rest. Yeah, he, he taught me how to block middle linebacker. Yeah, now we both love Jesus, and it's okay. So, yeah. What? I'm sorry, I couldn't understand. Gurgling. Come up, come up. <laughs> Help? Okay, well, I, I, yeah, I guess I can. I mean, folks, really, seriously? If you come to somebody that's in the water, it, you help them in spite of them. Anybody that knows anything about safety or rescuing somebody, if you go out to swim out and swim, swim out and help, I'm saying swim like six times because my tongue is way behind my brain, but if you swim out... <laughs> and you find somebody in the water and you're trying to drag them in, we all know that they'll try to drown you on accident because they're panicking. They're not going to come off as your best friend. 
But when you get them to the shore, you have a chance. But what fool would stand there and try to become best friends with a dying person that's drowning in the water when you had the power in your hand to save them? Amen. See, the, the reason we do that here in America is because we have a man-decided idea of what success is. We've got to get backsides in the seats so that we can make our report to the district of how big our church has grown and all of these things. Which is, folks, relationship, ministry is done in the context of relationship. I get that. But it must be Christocentric. It must be about Christ. We're not called to be buds with everybody in the world. We're called to save them. Amen. And you know what? A lot of them don't want to save them. And a lot of them will fight you on it. A lot of them will get angry. The word has to offend before it saves. How dare you come out here? You think I can't swim? No, you're dying. You're not making it on your own. This way is not working out. Well, I think it is. Folks, we have to get our minds in the agenda of what God sees as success. We have to follow him in light of those things. Paul went through some things in 2 Corinthians 4. We'll be reading this soon in our Wednesday night Bible study, verses 17 and 18. For our light momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We have to understand that with the things we do for God when we obey him in our call, it cannot be measured by worldly things. It has to be measured by the unseen, which is eternity. The things which you are doing may not look like it's made an impact today, and it may not look like it's great. Be faithful, child of God, and obey him and trust him that my obedience is good enough. And someday your work will be measured in eternity. We can't measure it by seeing things. I need to move on because I'm running out of time. Stinking worship went too long, prayer, people <laughs> seeking God and messed up. Lord, you totally messed up my sermon. He got it, folks. He's not mad at me. Ezekiel 2. We also see this, thirdly, the hurdle of sound theology and doctrine. We not only have to be humble, we not only uh, have to understand what God's idea of success is uh, by, by obedience, but we also have to get over the hurdle of sound theology and doctrine. Ezekiel 2 verses 8 through 10, and then Ezekiel 3 verses 1 through 4 says this, But you, son of man, listen to what I say to you. Do not rebel like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Then I looked and I saw a hand stretched out to me, and it was a scroll which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament and mourning and woe. And he said to me, Son of man, eat what is before you. Eat this scroll. Then go and speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he gave me the scroll to eat. Then he said to me, Son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it, and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. He then, touched, he then said to me, Son of man, go now to the house of Israel and speak my words to them. We see a beautiful parallel to this of John in the book of Revelation doing the exact same thing. But as we look at this today, folks, and, and, and grasp this, the Lord tells Ezekiel that not to rebel like the house of Israel. Not to rebel. And he gave him an option. He said, don't rebel before he handed him the word of God to eat. That's key. In other words, receive it all. Take it all. Consume it. Make it a part of you. Both the good and the difficult. That which is bitter, the judgment, and that which is sweet, the blessings. Receive it all. Let it become a part of your belly, that place where we have the promise of Jesus that out of our bellies will flow living water. The Word of God, folks, has got to become important. And we know this is an awesome picture in, in, of, of what Jesus did. We know that Jesus, he, he said he was the bread of life. We know that he, uh, he was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. We talked about this at Christmas time. We know that, that Bethlehem pointed also to the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, all of these things. That's where the lambs were raised for the sacrifice for Passover, yada, yada. You go down the list until Jesus says, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and I do have my flesh as real food and my blood as real drink. Remember that? Pointing toward the Passover and the Passover pointing toward the cross and, and the consuming. Jesus said, you have to eat it. In other words, fully receive. They were offended at it. I'm sure the disciples figured it out later when they sat down at the supper together, the Passover meal, and were like, I get it. He says, this is my body. This is my blood. 
Folks, we have to receive all of him. And I dare say that there's a lot of people that feel a call of God on their lives that may want to obey and do obey to some extent and, and do it humbly, but they don't, they don't submerse themselves in God's word or his presence. See, last year I did the whole read through the Bible with me in a year thing, and many of you did that for, with me. Folks, it's not about reading through the Bible in a year. It's about reading. And that put some of you in the process of reading when you hadn't done it for a long time. You had accountability, and now you're in the process of putting yourself into the Word. But I will, I will tell you this. Do not rebel. If you're going to enter into ministry and a call of God in your life, you've got to receive all of it. The good, bad, and the ugly. You've got to receive the Word of God, the judgment, the righteousness. Folks, we live in a culture and a time today where people... Uh, Put, subject God's word to constant surgery. They remove portions of it that are uncomfortable, things we don't want to talk about. People call themselves Pentecostal and still shut down the gifts of the Spirit in a service. Nobody speaks in tongues. Nobody prays for healing. Nobody has a word or anything else. I'm happy that there were about six different people that I was able to lay hands on and speak a word of knowledge to them this morning. Why? Because those things are real. Amen. Right? We don't remove that. Scripture says, scripture says not to forbid prophecy, not to, not to despise those things. So if we're going to receive the word and we're going to do ministry with the word, we must receive all of it. If we don't, then we have a seed of rebellion. And I dare say, if there's a portion of scripture that you rebel against, whether it's an issue of holiness, whether it's an issue of truth, whether it's an issue of the Spirit, then I'm telling you that seed of rebellion against the Word of God will blossom into full-blown rebellion against the Word of God. If you don't receive all of it, what you have rejected will grow into a root of bitterness against it. Ezekiel was not going to a fun situation. Ezekiel wasn't going to a, a, a fun place where he was going to be accepted and received by all. He had to be brave enough and full of the Spirit enough and full of the Word enough to speak what was true. If God says it's blessed, it's blessed. If God says it's sin, it's sin. If God says it will bring life, it will bring life. If God says it will bring death, it will bring death. There's no room for a partial gospel. If the Word is spoken is a call for repentance, then call for it. If the Word spoken is a warning of judgment, then call out in the streets. If the Word spoken is one of encouragement, then speak it to all who will hear. If you are called to minister in any form you are called to preach the full gospel that which is hard to hear you speak it that which is good to hear you speak it we do not adapt the message to win friends the message saves us some people say I'm not called to preach about sin preacher I'm just called to preach encouragement then you are a false prophet because we are called to swallow the entire word of God and bring out things, old and new. We're to bring out things, reminders repetitively of the word. In closing this morning, we need to be found humble and then remain in humility. We need to be obedient to his will to bring about a God success and not my own selfish fleshly success. And we need to be accurate in our doctrine. We need to receive the whole word and we need to be clear about all of it. And we need to educate ourselves in those things so that we can be a good student of the word and handle it properly as a responsible minister of God. Some of you say, Pastor, you just said, I'm not going to be called minister. Yes, you are. You know, you may not be the most popular person at your Thanksgiving table when the family's together, but you are a minister to them. Just say amen because it's there. You maybe weren't the most popular person at your family's Christmas party or your work Christmas party this last year. Anybody have to go to a work Christmas party? Dear God, in the world, talk about drunk fest. The Borden staff Christmas party wasn't, just so you know. <laughs> we did eat steak at the beef house. It was good. You may not be the most popular at your workplace or in the break room or anything else, but you're not called to be the most popular. God will give you favor when you need favor, but folks, I'm telling you, we must make the main thing the main thing. And that is to carry the word of God to those who need it. So in closing, I want to give you one, one encouragement in the midst of all this. Because as I told them in the first service, they just kind of looked at me like I had something crawling around my head. Uh, so, Pastor, I don't see where this is encouraging. Well, it's a little bit challenging, but this last part should be encouraging. Ezekiel 3, verses 7 through 9. But the house of Israel is not willing to listen to you. But if the, the house, But the house of Israel is not willing to listen to you because they are not willing to listen to me. For the whole house of Israel is hardened and obstinate. 
but I will make you as unyielding and hardened as they are. I will make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them, though they are a rebellious house. I love that because what God's saying to him is, Ezekiel, you're going to a rebellious people. They're not going to be nice to you. They're going to be stubborn. They're going to be obstinate. They're going to refuse you and reject you. But Ezekiel, don't worry about it because I'm going to give you what you need when you need it. You're going to be just as obstinate and stubborn in the right direction. You're going to be just as unyielding in the right direction. And you will stand for me and I will sustain you. It's not always going to be easy, folks, but it will be well. Amen? Sometimes God calls us to uncomfortable situations and uncomfortable places. It's not always going to be easy, but it will be well. Do you know, I don't know why I feel like I need to say this. I haven't even told my wife this. Uh, April right now is nervous. I usually tell her everything, and I just didn't. We've both had this happen to us at different times, but there's been two different times recently where the enemy has whispered a lie into my ear and said, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Twice it's happened in the last couple weeks. First time I heard it, I was like, what was that? Second time it happened, I was walking next to my wife and I had a conversation with that little voice. And I said, you don't have the power to do it. <laughs> Get behind me. You don't have the authority. And folks, the only reason that kind of nonsense happens to us is because we're in obedience to God. The enemy has no authority over us. He ain't going to take my life. And some of us are so afraid that we submit to that stuff. Listen, set your forehead as flint. Stand confident in the things of God and what he's called you to. Don't be afraid. I, told, I, I, I talked to April about that here a while back when Alyssa was gone on a missions trip at 15 years old in the nation of Peru by herself with a group, nobody from our church. And we're, parents were like, it's a little bit unnerving. And then talking about maybe studying in Haiti next year for a semester. As parents, you do your, your first reaction is, what? And then you go, oh, wait a second. She has a call on her life. She's fully submitted to God. I got nothing to be afraid of. Okay, enemy. Say whatever you want. I'm going to stand with my face as flint and say, you don't have authority over it. She's sealed by the Holy Spirit. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit. My family is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Who are you to make threats against me? Stand in boldness, child of God. It doesn't matter what it is. People, whether it's a spirit, whatever it may be, in your life, you don't have to be afraid because God has enabled you by the power of His Holy Spirit to lead you through it in what He has designed as your success in obedience to Him. Let the fruit be what it may. Amen? He's going to set you as flint. You're going to have the boldness you need to say what you need to say. You're going to have the strength to stand when you need to stand. And you're going to be able to do what you need to do. Even impossible situations will not move you because you have been moved and called and sent by the Spirit of God. Yet that is the wind that is blowing you. And folks, there is no object that can stop the wind when it's blowing. I will stand in the face of adversity with confidence because not only do I know that God's going to hold me up, the same spirit that set me on my feet is going to be the same spirit that keeps me on my feet and the same spirit that made me eat the word is the same spirit that, that spoke, Jesus spoke of that would give the disciples the words to say when they would stand before rulers and leaders. Folks, I don't have to be afraid of anything and neither do you. Stand with me this morning. So this morning as I pray over you and I speak this blessing over you, I do this weekly, most of the time, I don't do it every week, but we know and just as a reminder that this was something that the, the, the priests were told, Aaron was told to speak over the nation of Israel and by that way would impart the name of God upon them as they went their way. And folks, when I do this for you today, this is not just a ritual of sorts. As your pastor, I love you. 
And if I could impart anything to you, it would be the Spirit of God into your life. And my whole purpose of speaking to you today is the call, the challenge, and the movement forward for you to take up what it is that God's called you to do and go in the power of the Holy Spirit. So when I say this over you today, it's a confirmation of what it is that I've already prayed and desired for you today, that you would go in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you would stand, that you would see demons cast out, that you would see bodies healed, that you would see lives transformed and children saved for the kingdom of heaven, that you would go forth, child of God, in a mighty way, as a mighty army, throughout the highways and the byways, reaching those who need Jesus Christ, seeing their lives transformed, seeing drug addicts broken free from their addictions. Alcoholism would fall off. Bitterness, envy, and selfish ambition would be no more in our lives, purged with humility and the peace of God flowing forth from us. That's what God wants for us today. That's His will for us. Do you receive it? Lift your hands with me. Father, we receive your name upon ourselves today. God, that you would impart your spirit to us as we go our separate ways. May the Lord bless you and keep you, protecting you, surrounding you, maintaining you. May he make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, his power and his presence, his grace going with you. May he turn his countenance, his face, his look, his gaze towards you. He's looking at you, child of God. There be peace. He has a peaceful countenance towards you today as a follower of Jesus Christ. If you don't know him, submit to him right now, this minute, and he has a peaceful gaze to you. We receive you together, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said,